G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Um, as you can see, trade rumours are swirling, final series is coming up. I thought I would take a brief moment to have a look at the teams that missed out on finals this year and, and give a little bit of a report card, I suppose, as to how their season went against expectations and maybe contextualise their season somewhat. So what I'm going to do is work through the 10 teams that missed the finals starting from 9th, going down to 18th. Um, you know, having a look at what their season was like against expectations, giving them a letter grade, and perhaps a little comment about what they might do this off season as well. So we're going to start from Collingwood, who fi finished ninth in the end, um, and talk about how well they went against expectations. Now, the first one is probably a bit of a slam dunk, to be honest. Collingwood are the reigning premiers, and they started this year quite poorly. There was an opening round loss uh, against GWS from memory. Started the year 0-3, beat the Lions at the Gabba, um, returned to something resembling their best form. I mean, probably not quite at their top level. Beat some other major contenders or perceived major contenders at the time. Brisbane twice. They beat Carlton twice. Had some moments. Had a middle run period of the year there where I forget how many games they won in a row, but it was significant and they became a very, very difficult team to beat again before ultimately faltering late. There's a couple of draws there, some missed opportunities. I think they drew Essendon. They drew with Fremantle and Perth. Now, it's important to contextualize that against some injuries that they had to key players, and perhaps their depth was tested in a way that they couldn't really sustain. So it was a poor start to the season. I think we do need to factor in earlier start to the year as a team that played in the grand final. They had a shorter preseason. We also saw Brisbane start the year poorly. But overall, we do need to consider how they've performed against what we expected in the preseason. Now, I think their season expectations were probably to at least make the top four again. I mean, I don't think you need to set your pass and fail mark as being in the grand final and winning it. I think realistically, had they made the top four again this year, it more or less would have been a pass. However, they've missed out on finals altogether. I think this one is a slam dunk F, to be honest, which does not mean that I'm projecting onto Collingwood fans that they need to feel like this is a disaster of a season. I get the context, but we are measuring against what they achieved versus what we expected of them, what they internally expected of them. If you go back to the start of the season, you tell a Collingwood fan, we're not playing finals this year. I think that's a slam dunk F. Now, their off season is gonna be very interesting. We know they don't have a first round draft pick, which has come at a bad time. I think they could use a first round draft pick this year, but nonetheless, it's gone for Lockie Schultz. And they will need to get created to try and regenerate their list. I did see this morning, John Nobles requested a trade out of the club. The link to Petrarca, I don't know how realistic that is, but they can still find some money ball options, potentially some tools out of the clubs to try and improve their list. We know they're linked to Mark Keane. So I'll be interested to see what Collingwood do this off season. But as for their 2024 year, I think you have to give it an F. We'll move down to Fremantle who finished 10th and uh, you know hung with Port Adelaide in that game. And had they won that game, they would be playing in finals and not a part of this video at all. Nonetheless, they did finish 10th. And bearing in mind last year, they did finish 14th in a year where you'd have to say that was quite a disappointment because the year before that, they finished sixth or fifth or something like that. They, they won their first final against the Bulldogs and then lost a semi-final against Collingwood. So there was some, some degree of expect, expectation on improvement. I think we do need to factor in that Fremantle still have, I'm not really sure exactly where it sits in the competition now, but it's probably bottom five for age, still very young and inexperienced and at the end of 2022, did lose a heap of experienced players as well. So I think there's two ways to look at this. You look at the season holistically with, with Fremantle. What do we expect from them? What did they achieve? How they measured up against that? And I would say that going into this year, it would have been a pass mark for me, personally looking at them, to compete for finals, which is exactly what they've done. Okay, maybe Fremantle fans might have been more bullish and thought, no, we need to make finals. For me, I predicted them to finish about 11th. So for, to get at least close to finals was probably the minimum threshold, I think, for Fremantle. And they did get there. However, however, we look at the last month of the season and it's hard to argue that they didn't let it slip. They had four close losses, four pretty tough battles against some good teams. You could criticize them for the Essendon loss. They let a five goal lead slip or something like that. No doubt. But to lose to Geelong, GWS and Port, tough time to get those teams. Ultimately, they weren't good enough to get there. I understand the argument that you could be scathing on them because of the way they bottled that season when top two didn't seem like wildly unpredictable not that long ago. I'm going to take the stance of looking at this more at the big picture. 
Before I get any further into the video, I do wanna let you guys know that this particular video is brought to you in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Here at True Footy, we really do believe that looking after yourself, particularly mentally, is very important. And for me, what that looks like at the moment is I'm planning a big life change, moving back to Australia at the end of the year. And with that comes some fear of the future. And I suppose for me, the biggest focus is probably getting to a point where I can feel good about the future and feel good about the direction my life is pointing in. And a great way to handle that is being able to talk through it with somebody. I find it helpful to hear myself say things out loud and it makes me have a different assessment or a different perspective on the things that are going on in my head that were previously a bit nebulous. And of course as well, getting some feedback on those thoughts I find really helpful too. And I realize it's not easy for everyone to be able to talk to someone. One thing I can definitely relate to is not wanting to feel like a burden on the people in your life. You know, we feel like people have better things to do than listen to us. I'm not saying that's the right way to feel, but it's certainly something that is a human way to feel. So this is where BetterHelp could come in handy because they are a platform that can match you with a credentialed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. To get started in the process, you can go to the link in the description or just simply go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. You answer a few questions from there to assess your specific needs and then you'll be matched with a credentialed therapist, usually within 48 hours. You can do all of this from the comfort of your computer or your phone. You can do it through video chat, phone call or messaging. So let BetterHelp connect you with a therapist who can help you by going to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy. And with that, you also get a special discount on your first month. Fremantle did compete for finals. They got pretty close. They put themselves in a great position to get there. They faltered at the end. Ultimately, I don't think it was a lack of heart that cost them. I think it was some skills, some composure against better and more experienced teams. I'm gonna give them a C minus. I would give them a C, but I think I do probably weight slightly against the fact that they did let it slip to some extent, but I'm not gonna be more scathing than that because I think Fremantle pretty much did what was probably expected them of them as a minimum at the start of the year. And that's what we're measuring against this. Fremantle's off season looks fascinating. They held three first round picks because of uh, previous trades with Port Adelaide and Collingwood, massively in the market for Shea Bolton. Liam Baker also a 50-50 chance to pick Fremantle, you'd think at this stage, perhaps Jack Martin as well. They're gonna be quite active and um, you know the impact that a trade with Richmond has on the draft will be fascinating. So wait and see on Fremantle. I think they should improve next year. This year, I think they were about par. So then we move to Essendon. This is another fascinating one as well. And it, probably a very similar narrative to Fremantle, broadly speaking, in that they were in a great position to potentially make top four. I think they were second at one point, if I'm not making that up. Ultimately, failed towards the end of the season, faltered hard, not as hard as last year, but nonetheless let some, some games slip and ultimately finished in the exact same spot they did last year, which is 11th place. Now, this one is a little trickier. So on the same, by the same token, I think to finish in the same spot as last year obviously is not horrendous, and I would argue they did improve. They did get better as a team. I think when they played their best football this year, they put some teams to the sword. I think we've seen some growth from some young players that can take this team to the next level outside of Zach Merritt, who's amazing all the time. Durham, Caldwell, Nick Martin to some extent, uh, Xavier Dersma in patches. Nate Caddy's debut, I think Nate Caddy might be the best draft pick Essendon has taken for a long, long time. There is some signs of future growth there and certain players starting to hit their prime and improve. Ultimately, Essendon kind of couldn't capitalize on the position they were in. However, I do think it's worth noting that last year, they were similarly around the mark for finals and then had a horrendous end to the season. And I think Essendon, you know, putting up a bit of a fight against the Brisbane Lions to beat Fremantle is improvement. Now, how much do we consider that improvement a positive? Probably not the best way to phrase it. How significant is that improvement? I think you do need to factor in they are a mature team. So what sets them apart from Fremantle is that they have a lot of players around their prime. Fremantle is significantly younger as far as list age goes in terms of experience too. So you could reasonably have expected Essendon to improve more. I think over the stretch, I'm gonna give them a D for this year. Unlike Fremantle, they did not move up. Fremantle moved up four spots against last year's ladder. Essendon stayed about the same and they did still have a drop off. So while they dropped off harder last year, I think that is relevant, but it still probably doesn't save them from a D in my opinion. Their off season outlook will be interesting. They're potentially gonna have essentially two first round picks with Isaac Carco, a next generation academy player. So there'll be a player in this year's draft, no doubt. Um, they'll be looking to keep someone like a Ben Hobbs at this stage, who uh, has been linked to a potential move elsewhere. But other than that, I think Essendon might be looking towards the draft this year. Let's talk about the Saints. This is a very weird one. 
This is a very weird one to rate. So they finished uh, sixth last year, only to finish 12th this year with a team that is relatively mature, some good experienced veteran players on that list and a good budding group of young players that I think could be very good talents at AFL level going forward. So they've got a really nice spread of age and experience and talent across that as well. They had a pretty shoddy middle part of the year from memory. That mid-season form slump was quite poor, but they won six of the last eight, and that's what makes this interesting. So those six wins include a win over uh, Geelong towards the back end of the season, and Geelong around that were playing some good footy. They beat the Swans at Marvel. They beat the Blues in the final round, although the Blues were depleted. Still a good win. They had a huge win over Essendon as well. So some really compelling form there. And also, notably, the ability to score over 100 points really went from being an issue for St Kilda to being something they did somewhat regularly at the back end of the year. So I do think there's a lot they can take out of the back end of the year. And going forward, I think the exposure to youth has served them really well. Wanganeen Miller is a star. Darcy Wilson had a great debut season. Philip, who as well, you know, when he came back into the side around injury, I thought, you know, he's going to be a high level player. Liam Henry, I think, also worked well into that team and still a pretty young player. So, how do we grade St Kilda? I think, if you're being fair, I, I do think they ended the season well, but if you look at expectations, the maturity of the list, where they finished last year, playing in a home final, I don't think you can give them anything but an F. So I know that probably doesn't marry up with my optimism about what I saw in St Kilda late, but the mid-season form slump was quite poor, and I think their expectations should be higher than that. What are they doing this preseason? Well, I've seen them link to Peatling. I've seen them link to Dylan Shield. Outside of that, not a lot of noise. I do think, you know, as this Christian Petrarca story gains momentum, and by the time you're watching this, you probably still, like, that story's probably developed, but... They might actually be one of the few clubs that could be in a position to get him if they do get a band one compensation pick for Josh Battle, which remains to be seen. But if they have, say, picks eight and nine in the draft, then they might have the best offer for Melbourne, which could be enough for them to turn Petrarca's head. We'll move to the Gold Coast Suns now, who finished 13th, which is two spots up from 15th on last year. New coach coming into this year, David ha- uh, Damian Hardwick, rather, the big signing from Richmond bit of a bombshell uh, signing to join as senior coach. With that always came some sort of expectation. We'd see some improvement bearing in mind. I don't think you can ever realistically expect a new coach to make a huge impact in their first season. So in my opinion, expecting Gold Coast to realistically play finals this year was not super realistic. There was a bit of talk about how they're having the easiest fixture, but the way that the fixture difficulty is great. It is against the quality of teams last year. So I don't know how difficult Gold Coast fixture was, but I see other commentators clinging to this idea that they had the easiest fixture. I think, you know, West Coast by far played the least amount of top eight sides. Um, Great. You could describe them as inconsistent this year. Well, they were consistently inconsistent, winning almost every home game and losing almost every away game. That trend was bucked at the end of the year. I think they won two away games and lost two home games against uh, the Demons, and they also lost to the Brisbane Lions, didn't they? Um, What did they take out of this year? I think we can acknowledge that they have a young group of players that are probably just pre-prime that have taken strides this year. I mean, Matthew Rowell is clearing his game, particularly in the first half of the year, was outstanding. Noah Anderson, also great. Sam Flanders has emerged to be one of their best players now as well. I think he broke their disposal record. So that's something. But we also saw big growth out of Ben King, who had a career best season. Mac Andrew is also becoming a very dynamic match winner player. Bodie Uland as well, another defender there. There's too many to name. But I do think we do need to remember that the players that are going to take Gold Coast forward are like 23, 24 in most cases. All of that is to say that I don't think they should have been a finals contender, but they should have been aiming for top 10. And they've never finished higher than 12th. I think a realistic aim would have been to exceed 12th position. How do we grade them then? I think this is probably the best Gold Coast team we've seen in a number of years. Is a C- minus too generous? It's either C- minus or a D. I think they still finish 13th. To be honest, I don't think this... This latter position will matter soon. I do think Gold Coast will will improve significantly down the line, and it may not be that far away. Against expectations, I can't decide if it's a C- minus or a D. I'll probably say D. I'll probably say D, to be fair. They're not super young if you look at age demographic of list, but they are young in terms of the players that really win games for them. Let's go with D. I think that's fair. Off-season outlook, well, they've been linked to uh, Dan Rioli. I think John Noble has also been uh, has requested a trade this morning as I'm recording this. They'll also get a Northern Academy talent in Lombard this year. 
A little bit of a faint hope around Dusty Martin. I don't know if that's likely at all. They would have to get Dusty to come out of retirement, which I suppose is possible, but whatever. Jack Lacocious as well has been linked to a move to either Adelaide or Melbourne. So we'll see what happens there. And I mean the cities, not the football clubs. Speaking of Melbourne, the football club, let's talk about them. This has been a bleak year, a year of turmoil for the Melbourne Football Club in which they finished 14th in the end after last year making the top four and going out in straight sets. And the negative vibe and external noise about Melbourne has been negative all year. Going back to the preseason, um, there was rumours of you know discontent and you know Joel Smith gets a ban. Um, Angus Brayshaw unfortunately retires earlier in the season, so there's some adversity stacking up. There's always been a lot of noise around Clayton Oliver. That has not improved as the season has progressed. In fact, it's um, it might even be reading, reaching fever pitch at the moment. So there was always a noise about Clayton Oliver requesting a trade. That's about third story back at the moment. He hasn't requested a trade, just to be perfectly clear, but there has been noise as recently as early this year. Talk about Christian Petrarca. First of all, the adversity of his season-ending injury, which, you know, some details have come out about that. It's harrowing stuff. Um, and now that has led to Petrarca potentially requesting a trade. Again, by the time this video comes out, that story might have progressed. But we also know Alex Neil Bullen has requested a trade. So in terms of this season, um, you know, I think, I think it's fair to say it was a pretty bleak season. I think their best football was good, but they still had some horrendous losses. So they had a big loss to... I think it started with West Coast in Perth. They had two big losses against Fremantle. They got smashed by Collingwood towards the end of the year, the Dogs as well, um, and ultimately finished bottom five. Now, falling that far might help them because it gives them a better draft pick. They'll have what is currently pick five in this year's draft. And I want to do a Melbourne video on their offseason in isolation because I think this they have emerged as a huge player potentially, and I think the word crossroads comes to mind with Melbourne. If there is a scenario where Christian Petrarca leaves the Melbourne Football Club this year and, you know, Alex Neil Bullen goes, then I think it kind of completely flips on its head where Melbourne is at with their list. And it may be time to set a different path for the Melbourne Footy Club. So they're going to hold a top five draft pick this year. Who knows what will happen with Petrarca? Who knows what will happen with Clayton Oliver? We know that Neil Bullen's going, but I think that'll be a fascinating watch. And, you know, maybe, maybe, this could work out for them in the sense that I think if you look at which teams are most vulnerable to Tasmania coming into the competition, you look at the teams that are not rebuilding now, but are the teams that are about to fall off a cliff in terms of age. And I think Melbourne has been aging for a while. I think they've got a good young stack of talent and they have been hitting the draft. So that makes them different to someone like Collingwood. But if they can double down and really invest in this year's draft um, in light of other players leaving, this could be better than, say, this all coming to a head in three years' time. Anyway, I've barely talked about this season. I'm talking more about their off-season. Um, we know that this season was a stinker for Melbourne. I think a resounding F on performance is an absolute no-brainer. Let's talk about the Adelaide Crows, one of the more disappointing teams from this season, again, considering the optimism around them. They were unlucky to not play finals last year, and this year slumped into the bottom four. Now, I would say they're clearly a fair level up from the bottom three teams. It was, you know, the bottom three teams competing this year and then a bit more of a glut above. So them and St Kilda kept switching spots. There is still some good footy there. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think their expectation this year would have been to play finals. There's no doubt about that when they got very close last year. And they have been rebuilding, I suppose, for a little while now. They had one of the biggest gaps between their best and worst footy this year. And, um, you know, it didn't even seem to come in clumps. It seemed very sporadic this year for the Adelaide Crows. Some questions around their midfield and how that, you know, worked in terms of getting the ball from inside to outside to inside 50. There's some dynamic stuff uh, that needs a little bit of work there. But they started the season poorly. They were 0-4. Then they beat Carlton, which was a big win at the time. They also beat the power in the showdown. The power finished top two in the end. They drew the Brisbane Lions at Adelaide Oval. There's some good footy there. They also ended the year with a win over the Saints, who were in red-hot form around that time. They beat the Giants, which is great, considering how good the Giants are, you know, away from home. They smashed the Western Bulldogs, who were also in great form. So there's a huge mess of form here with the Adelaide Crows that is very, very hard to assess where they're really at, because the gap between their best and worst may be the most significant of any team this year. The worst also involved a loss to Richmond at home, who only lost two games this year, which ironically the other one was against the minor premiers. Um, and they also had a huge loss late to Hawthorne around some of their good form. So talk about a mess of a season. I think looking at how they performed against expectations, would you give them an F? I think if you realistically expect to play finals, and I realistically expected Adelaide to play finals, I'm sure their fans did. To finish bottom four, 
if you're looking at purely on ladder position, probably is an F. If it's not an F, it's a D minus. The fact that they still played good footy and showed that there's some form underneath is positive. And perhaps I sense that there's a case of growing pains with the Adelaide Crows here. I think some game style tweaks and an injection, a little bit more talent just to round them off could you know see them quickly improve but like i said bottom four sounds bad on paper but they were significantly better than the bottom three and not that much off you know the teams immediately above them like gold coast and st kilda there wasn't a huge gap there i think if you realistically expect to play finals though probably an f i think it probably is a bleak year for the adelaide crows but i think there is still some light at the end of the tunnel for sure. In terms of their off-season, they've been linked to Isaac Cumming. Uh, Jack Lacoche will have to be a consideration, I'm sure. Alex Neil Bullen is probably likely to get to the Crows, or at least 50-50. He's, he requested a trade to South Australia. And who knows what will happen with Clayton Oliver, though. That one's probably a little bit less likely. Let's talk about the West Coast Eagles, who finished the year in 16th position after uh, winning a wooden spoon last year. What was a reasonable expectation for West Coast this year? I think the external noise expected them to win like one game this year. I don't think personally that was ever going to be reasonable when you consider players coming back from injury. And that was something that I personally stuck to all preseason. I was like, the Eagles have a better injury run. They will win five or six games. That was my expectation. That's exactly where they've ended up. Um, I will say as a fan, you know, considering the lackluster huge 12-week or 10-week period in the middle of the year where they were diabolical. Um, it's hard to feel good about this season. Um, and I think you do need to consider the better injury run means we probably should mark them a little bit more harshly and less so just on the fact that they won more games than last year. I think a D is about right for West Coast where, yes, they improved. The percentage improved significantly. They should have always improved given they had an okay injury run this year. I think it was probably still a little worse than average depending on how you measure the impact of injuries, like games lost, it was still probably high, but overall, enough opportunity to get the best 22 together. And I think at times fell short, very well short of the mark for large periods of the season and ultimately lost their coach. And that probably underscores my point as good as anything else I can say. I think a D is about right. Um, you know, others will say that they probably achieved more than they expected, but I think considering the context, a D for West Coast. As for the off-season outlook, I think it's gonna be a season, an off-season of attacking the draft. There's been a little bit of noise around Liam Baker and Jack Graham as experienced talents. James Peatling, Riley Garcia, Jack Carroll, a few West Australian talents there. Uh, West Coast are probably gonna be fairly aggressive this year. Tom Barris is out the door, he's requested a trade. A little bit of noise around Ryan and Darling probably less likely to, to get suitors for those guys. So I think that will be an interesting watch as well, West Coast. We'll go to North Melbourne. Um, this one's another interesting one where, where you look at it on paper and they have gone backwards in terms of performance this year. So uh, they finished 17th last year. They again finished 17th this year. Three wins both years, 8% less this year, which is interesting because I think that watching North Melbourne has led me to believe they have improved. And I don't think the latter position or the, the raw numbers there tell the story. What were their season expectations? Again, separating from what North fans were saying preseason about them shooting up the ladder, again, I, I shouldn't generalize. You know, there's always a cohort of any fan base that thinks the team's going to improve rapidly. But personally, I, I don't think that was ever realistic with the list position that North is in and how young it is. So I, I'm going to say their season expectations would be to ideally lose, avoid the spoon or even bottom two. They have more or less done that. And I think, okay, they started the season poorly and they certainly finished it poorly. The middle part of the season, I feel like the, the form that they showed there on the back of some genuine young talent is very compelling. And I think this is the most positive season North Melbourne's produced in a while. I think they were significantly better than last year. Last year, they started 2-0 and lost 20 games in a row. The year before that, I'm a little blurry, but they won the wooden spoon uh, with a two-win season. So I think the, the improvement being driven by the young talent is a huge variable in me potentially thinking this season for North Melbourne was better than what other people are suggesting. I also think some of their best form coincided with a relatively tough fixture. You know, they played some really good performances against good teams and fell short. Had the fixture been structured slightly different, North Melbourne may have won more games. I'm going to give them a C. Not so much on the fact that they avoided the spoon, but because of what we saw from them this year. With such a young team blowing out in the final fortnight of the season, I can forgive that, to be honest. So a C is what I give them. What are they looking at this off season? Um, well, I think they've sort of heralded the idea that they might target some experienced players. They may be in the market for Luke Parker, 
Um, I think Ollie Wines is off the table. Nick Haynes is an option. They haven't been linked to these players, just some ideas there. Uh, Tim Membry is another one that they could potentially get. They could also split their pick, um, which we can talk about in another video, but they could trade down to, to get some tolls this year's draft. And finally, we'll move on to the Richmond Football Club, who won uh, a wooden spoon. I think this will be the first time since 2004, I want to say. Well, that was the last time they had pick one when they took Brett Delidio. Uh, last year, they finished 13th with 10 wins, and this year, just the two wins, which I believe is their worst ever season. So let's contextualize this. What do we expect of Richmond going into this year? Well, I think there was some very divergent views on Richmond going into the next season because their star talent, their top-end talent is pretty good. What I forecasted at the start of the season was an alarming lack of depth. And that was before you even considered a horrific injury injury run. And I know that they did have one. Um, how many L's, ACLs did they have? You know, them in Brisbane. I feel like had some a significant amount of that. But just like key players missing for long, long periods of time. Tom Lynch, late start to the season. I want to say they missed Presti for a while. Dusty missed footy. Like, it just all went wrong for Richmond. But I also thought they went into the year lacking depth and certainly lacking some young talent. So my expectation, well, my prediction for them was always going to be bottom four. And I think I had them third last in my ladder prediction. So to some extent, I saw this coming. The injury run was far worse than I could have ever predicted, and I think they were overexposed. So while I think they went into this year a little bit light on for depth, there's no doubt about that, you also factor in how much adversity they had, and I think I'm willing to be a little bit lenient here on Richmond's season. Things fell apart this year, and I think you know they're just gonna get some very welcome access to the draft. As for grading their season, I'm gonna give them a D. I don't think they were that bad. They had a couple of terrible losses I want to say against the Brisbane Lions and the Western Bulldogs. But considering their injuries, I think those were inevitable. And I think there were plenty of games there where they hung in there okay and stopped being pathetic. And maybe, maybe my own club over the last few years, certainly with injuries, has set a new level of expectation around what a team that bad should be producing. And I think Richmond held their own okay. I think giving them an F for a season like this where the injuries destroyed them, would be exceedingly harsh. And I think a D is about right. What will happen to them this offseason is fascinating. I've done a whole video on this. It's called How Richmond Can Blow Up the AFL Trade Period. And they will be a huge playmaker with potential deals for Dan Rioli, Shea Bolton, Liam Baker. I'm not sure about Jack Graham at this current point in time. I think they should look at underappreciated young talents from other clubs too. You know, what's Will Brody up to these days? Uh, will Phillips, um, Ben Hobbs. Like These are the sort of somewhat mature and talented underappreciated talents at other clubs that could look at but there's a lot to play out there so overall richmond get a big fat juicy d from me oh God. overall richmond get a d it was far from an ideal season but i think if you're measuring performance against what we could have reasonably expected from them i might be being generous there but i think an f is too harsh it's got to be a d so that will do guys let me know in the comments what you thought of all my uh final season gradings for the non-finalists this year and i'll see you in the next one cheers